Uh, good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, uh, welcome everyone to the two-day conference on universal ethics for the 21st century towards a common understanding uh, organized by Tibet House, the Culture Center of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and Samir Ling Tibetan Settlement Office. I uh, heartily would like to welcome to all the chief, uh, sorry, all the speakers, uh, participants, our chief guest, Kasur Ngodub Dongchungla, and our guests of no uh, honor Professor Siddiq Wahid and all the speakers who have come all over India. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome our chief guest, Kasur Ngodub Dongjungla, uh, representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama Delhi, and Professor Siddiq Wahid, uh, a scholar in residence, Shivnada uh, University, uh, Venerable Kishi Doji Damdula, Director, Tibet House, Kungo uh, Pinsu Topkila, Tibetan uh, uh, Settlement Officer, Samir Ling, Tibetan Settlement, and Dr. Kaveri Gill, uh, Conference Convener, to uh, uh, come on the dais. May I now request Kungo uh, Pinsu Topkila to honor our chief guest and guest of honor with a katak and a souvenir. Kasur, uh, Professor Siddiq Wahid, uh, our guest of honor, scholar in residence, Shivnadar University. Kasur Ngotub Dongchungla, representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi. Uh, Venerable Geshe Doji Damdula, director, Tibet House. Dr. Kaveri Gill, uh, Associate Professor, Shivnada University. Uh, to begin with, I would like to uh, give a brief introduction of the two organizer. Uh, Tibet House, the culture, uh, culture center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, was established by His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1965 uh, with the vision of universal interdependence and need to develop a sense of harmony and compassion as the basis of hum happiness of hum for humanity and to preserve the rich cultural heritage of Tibet. Tibet House has its humble beginnings in Jorbak, after which it moved to its present location in Lodi Road. Tibet House aims to bring together Buddhist masters and Tibetologists, people across different disciplines, students and practitioners, and the common man through its various programs and events. With growing interest in Buddhist teachings world, worldwide, Tibet House continues to expand its objectives in saving Tibet's heritage and in exploring, work, exploring and working towards Tibet House's potential contribution to the ethical development of the modern society. Tibet House has a library, museum, various study programs on Buddhist philosophy, conferences on interdisciplinary subjects such as neuroscience and Buddhist psychology, quantum physics, spiritual ecology, and universal ethics. Uh, and we also have uh, two programs, two different programs. Uh, one, uh, in 2016, we launched a, a four-year uh, master's course in Nalanda Buddhist philosophy, which was launched by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And at current, we have around 360 participants from 42 countries. And 
and there's another program called Nalanta Diploma Course, which we inaugurated in 2018. And at present, we have uh, around 520 students from 39 countries. Uh, now, uh, I would like to briefly introduce about uh, Samir Ling uh, Tibetan Settlement Office. Um, Samiling Tibetan Settlement, uh, officially also known as New, Ar New Aruna Nagar, is located on the banks of Yamuna River in Delhi. It began in 1960 when the government of India allotted a small piece of land to the Tibetan refugees. Later, after the Sino-Indian War of 1962, many Tibetan refugees who had initially settled in the Indo-Tibetan border areas also moved and resettled in this settlement. With a population of over 1,500, the settlement today has developed into a major tourist hub for Tibetan travelers as well as foreigners visiting India, especially uh, those who are already familiar with Tibetan people and culture. The settlement is also equipped with a day school, medical clinics based on both allopathic and traditional Tibetan systems of medicines, monastic temples, etc. With an amazing assortment of wide area of restaurants, shops and vendors, the settlement today has become not only the preferred stopover for Tibetan travels, but travelers, but also a major attraction for local Indians and foreigners. The overall ad administration of the settlement is managed by the settlement office. Some of its main role and responsibilities are welfare of Tibetans living in Delhi, uh, health, uh, of religion and culture uh, and uh, education. Now, uh, that's, all, uh, that's a brief introduction of the two organizers. Uh, now, may I request uh, Dr. Kaveri Gill, uh, the conference uh, convener, uh, to give an overview of the conference. Thank you. Is it maybe the lights can be dimmed? for the presentation. Thank you, Tenshala. So, Tashi Dele, and good morning. Um, so, to our chief guest, Kasur Nodup Dongchungla, the guest of honor, Professor Siddiq Wahid, the director of Tibet House, Venerable Geshe Dorji Damdol, the Samiling Tibetan Settlement Officer, Kungo Punsakla, esteemed panelists, students, and my students from Shivnada University, and uh, from, the, from the Tibetan Youth Hostel from Rohini, and all our audience, welcome. So it gives me great pleasure for those of us who went to Delhi University as our first undergraduate degree, Majnu Katila, <laughs> has a certain connotation. It's something beloved to a lot of Delhi and a lot of North Campus people. And we visit here, we know it in a certain way. So it is because of the initiative of the young Tibetan settlement officer, Kungo Punsakla, who approached Geshela and said, why not we have an academic conference? Because uh, in a way, the settlement is known, as Tenshela said, as a commercial hub, as a place of travel, stay, and also passage. And we stand here today, we are going to look at the question of universal ethics and I would like to say we are standing here today uh, in an unauthorized colony, 60 years after it was formed, as there are many, there are many urban scholars and friends here, colleagues who have come. So this is something that Delhi is known for, they are all marginalized settlements. And of course a refugee community that has in many ways, you know, transcended all the circumstances. Um, you know, so that's the background and it gives me great pleasure to be here and uh, it's a great honor. So why universal ethics for the 21st century um, and towards a common understanding? Can you just, can you? Oh. No, I want to change the slide. No, how can I change the slide? Sorry, I'm a Luddite and technology never works for me. <laughs> yeah. So what do I have to press? This, this, this one. Okay. So, you know, so there's a recent publication um, that His Holiness has come up on the question of climate change. Uh, it's a co-edited volume. Um, 
on climate change and he says you know what is wrong ultimately it is due to a lack of ethics it is due to a lack of self-discipline for self-discipline is entirely based on ethics we have the responsibility to bring awareness to the fact that the many problems we are facing ultimately result from a lack of inner discipline and of moral ethics while the primary way to promote moral ethics is through religion many religions including buddhism have had opportunities over the last thousand years or so to promote ethics and have often failed so now we must find new ways and means to create conviction in others that behaving ethically is in our own best interests and for our own well-being that is the main goal so we stand here today there are many students and we see what's going on all around us even in india so i don't think we need to stress you know the need for some other kind of basis for uh, secular or universal ethics so what does he define this approach as one being based on scientific findings on common experience and on common sense and this evening we'll be seeing a movie on you know his contributions or engagement with scientists because i think especially for all the youngsters in the room and this generation uh, it's science you know scientific under uh, uh, findings are critical in order to create a firm basis for these ethics secular as defined in our indian constitution i need say no more you must be reading the news every day so i think it's a notion that we do respect all religions and non believers and others as well and of course we live in a world of increasing globalization interconnectedness economic political social in all dimensions so the question of you know how to transcend what could otherwise become a very exclusionary us versus them uh, um kind of dynamic now what is the problem uh, religion and ethics traditionally of course religion has been a source of ethics but if we think of the two categories of religion theistic and non theistic in a theistic understanding there's kind a kind of ethics stems from an external uh, you know god creator god the notion that one has to you know uh do justice to that god as loving and you know whatever great attributes and in the non theistic perspective it would be the law of causality or karma so these are metaphysical things that are not necessarily able to be proven in empirical ways so therefore science which of course has undermined faith in traditional religion if you look at the figures worldwide the numbers of people who subscribe to a religious perspective has dropped radically and will i think continue to do so so we cannot look to that as a source for such said ethics um, and at the same time we'll see from many of uh, the speakers in panels 2 and 3 that the need for ethics some kind of basis and a common understanding is critical because we have many challenges that we have never had before be they in the fear of technology ai you know uh, the internet web space all kinds of things so then his holiness sets out that you know is it possible to come up with a notion of universal ethics that are basically based on two principles one is a common humanity and underlying that is a recognition of you know that each of us desire however we define it a notion of happiness and to avoid suffering and the second would be a notion of interdependence uh, including with animals and you know it's not an anthropocentric view and if we can you know if these two principles if we come to a reasoned understanding about them then we see our well-being inextricably bound up with that of others and you know that could be a basis now you know of course the social sciences and philosophy itself this notion of happiness i use that term very loosely whatever it means uh, you know it it's a complex uh, phenomena but it's amazing how many economists like richard leard and many other people mainstream economists who uh, worked on um, macroeconomics are all now you know looking at the question of happiness and they basically you know there are two levels of satisfaction one is the sensory which you know of course that's important and i would say amartya sen the nobel or its work and many others it does fall in this category of seeing you know uh, a life well lived as you know having certain capabilities functionings which include health friendship well being all of that but then there comes a deeper level of satisfaction or happiness or whatever one may choose to call it that depends on a stable you know uh, state of mind um and that basically he sets out two other factors that he sees as important a sense of purpose which transcends narrow self interests and a feeling of being connected to others and he posits that underlying these one of the central values is compassion 
Now, grounding ethics in human nature, and this was one of the key uh, questions for this conference to discuss, and panel one is going to look at this, uh, on whether human nature is innately selfish, or there is innately, you know, altruistic, has uh, uh, kindness, compassion, many other features, you know, as something in it. Um, and I think we'll hear from panel one on this uh, question, uh, but the point is that I think the most widely accepted position would be that somewhere we have a mix of the two, and this is an interdisciplinary from many, many different uh, disciplines. But the central point here is that, you know, if you think essential human nature is innately selfish, which is what economics and many other disciplines that have held disproportionate sway in the world, in the neoliberal regime that we live under today with increasing inequality, consumption, the basic underlying premise is that individuals are supremely selfish and they are innately so. If this is the case, then ethics has to be grounded in something outside of ourselves. Whereas if we see that we have some of these um, traits within us, then it's a question of really you know developing that um and, you know, as somebody is a lapsed economist, I did train in it and I see many problems. And one of the things is the a question of, you know, power in epistemology. I say this because there are a lot of social scientists sitting here. Adam Smith is known far more for his later work, The Wealth of Nations, than actually his first work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where he articulates human nature as being essentially altruistic and in a way coming to very much the same point that the Dalai Lama or others today so he says, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him. Though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Of this kind is pity or compassion, the emotion which we feel for the misery of others when we either see it or are made to conceive it in a very lively manner. That we often derive sorrow from the sorrow of others is a matter of fact too obvious to require any instances to prove it for this sentiment like all other uh, original passions of human nature is by no means confined to the virtuous and the humane though they perhaps may feel it with the most exquisite sensibility the greatest ruffian the most hardened violator of the laws of society is not altogether without it so here he is in the famous opening passage of the theory of moral sentiments positing human nature as being intrinsically um, now I won't go into compassion as one of the values because I think some of our panelists are going to talk about it but I just want to say that there will be reasoning extended you know rather than a kind of a moral argument that all the religions of the world and others you know have extended so but rather using reasoning this notion of a common humanity and at a more sophisticated level interdependence and depending on our epistemic and ontological sophistication if you see now what quantum physics and other kind of science is coming up with on the degree of you know the object subject interaction and so on and so forth we can then have a very nuanced understanding of our interdependence in this world but even if we don't go that far we can just use our common sense and think that you know the plastic bottle I throw in a river in Goa is likely to end up in the you know Brazil or somewhere so interdependence and we see that in the economic sphere the EU and all other I don't want to and the question of you know I will um, not go into these. Uh, so I will end with another rationalist perspective on happiness and this is Bertrand Russell. So it's amazing to me how many, many different thinkers from different time periods and, you know, uh, also talks about, you know, the notion of happiness as, you know, so in, f in fact the whole antithesis between self and the rest of the world disappears as soon as we have any genuine interest in persons or things outside ourselves. Though such interests a man, through such interests a man comes to feel himself part of the stream of life not a hard separate entity like a billiard ball which can have no relation with other entities except that of collision. All unhappiness depends on some kind of disintegration or lack of integration. There is disintegration within the self through a lack of coordination between the conscious and unconscious mind. There is a lack of integration between the self and society where the two are not knit together by the force of objective interests and affections. The happy man is the man or woman who does not 
suffer from either of these failures of unity, whose personality is neither divided against itself nor pitted against the world. Such a man feels himself a citizen of the universe, enjoying freely the spectacle that it offers and the joys that it affords, untroubled by the thought of death because he feels himself not really separate from those who will come after him. It is in such profound instinctive union with the stream of life that the greatest joy is to be found. So here we are seeing Bertrand Russell, Adam Smith, uh, His Holiness, many other thinkers, you know. So now the questions for this, uh, because we are not coming to an a priori conclusion, the questions for this conference. So if this is the case, is it the case that from a scientific perspective, we can talk about universal values or is that a utopian idea? This is the first panel is going to explore this question. Panel two is going to talk about very serious ethical questions on the ground today. We are going to talk about education, higher education. We are going to talk about uh, water uh, and the Tibetan plateau. And we are also going to talk about, um, I'm sorry, my memory is failing me. There's a third, <laughs> um, you know, um, uh, we are going to the first panel, uh, second panel, sorry. The third panel is going to look at some frontier areas in terms of technology and GM crops, in terms of ethics outside certainty and in terms of entrepreneurship and whether or not you know how what uh, is that an opportunity or frankly foreclosed in terms of ethics and the last panel will look at praxis and some you know I hopefully we end on an uplifting note because everything nowadays is rather gloomy <laughs> so <clears throat> with that I will um, thank you all for being here and welcome Thank you, Dr. Kavirila. Uh, now may I request uh, Venerable Geshe Doji Damdila, Director Tibet House, to deliver the keynote address. Venerable Geshe Doji Damdila is currently the Director of Tibet House, Culture Center of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. He travels widely within India and abroad to teach Buddhist philosophy, psychology, logic, and practice. He has also worked on several books. As assigned by the Office of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, he worked with Professor Paul Ekman on His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's book, Ethics for a New Millennium Part 2 and the book series Art of Happiness. He has written a number of papers for national and international conferences on topics such as the paradox of the brain and mind and ultimate reality according to Aryan Nagarjuna. Venerable Keshe Doji Tamtla. Good morning and uh, welcome you all to this conference, Universal Ethics uh, Towards a Common Understanding. A uh, respected chief guest, Akasur Kumutubla, and our guest of honor, uh, Professor Siddiqji, and um, the, the head of Samyeling Tibetan Settlement, Mr. Pinsotopkela and uh, Professor Kaviriji from Shivnadar University. Uh, in fact, I'd like to, just for your information, the, uh, I'm very happy that this kind of academic uh, conference is being held in Samailing Tibetan Monastery, the settlement. And um, it is really a great joy, a, a new era, happening in the history of um, Samyeling settlement. So I'd like to share with you very quickly the genesis of two things. One is of the universal ethics. Number two, about this conference, how this came into a conception. First, the, of the universal ethics. I remember um, when I was traveling with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the, as his entourage for several years, one thing that I noticed was that constantly, oftentimes, so many questions are coming up to His Holiness from the experts, educationists, economists, medical experts, and then the social workers, and so forth, that while the modern education is meant to bring about prosperity, bring about harmony, bring about great, greater happiness in the world. On the contrary, 
while the modern education leaps its height, leaps to, leaps to its height, these what is expected, the harmony, prosperity, and then the the peace and so forth, they're all declining. More corruptions and more wars, more conflicts. So where are we going wrong? This is the common question asked to His Holiness by all these experts. And then His Holiness, I remember so well, without hesitation, he would say that the modern education, there's a flaw in the modern education, incompleteness in the modern education. Modern education, how it is designed and how we inherit it, where from we inherited this. We inherit from the Britishers. And from what time? From, say, the Industrial Revolution, where there's a there was a tremendous emphasis on the material development, where 2 plus 2 equals 4. That counts, not your heart. So the whole education system developed on that ground, industrial revolution, is designed in such a way that there's a brain development and not necessarily a heart development. Because of this Im Im imbalance, there's a tremendous brain development is happening. Today, for example, believe it or not, we all were from schools in one way or the other, schools, colleges, universities. If you say 2 plus 2 equals 4, pass. If you say 2 plus 2 equals 4-ish, fail. Even if you have the capacity to become the second Mahatma Gandhi, you will not be counted as a person if you say 2 plus 2 equals 4-ish. So this is what the modern education is all about. Because of this, there's a flaw in modern education. There's no room for, to encourage the heart development, only the room for brain development. So more the brain developed, but when the heart is neglected, all these corruptions, say, somebody who is totally illiterate engaging in corruption, and somebody who is so sophisticatedly learned in the, the economics going to corruption is going to be very different. So they can really corrupt the whole bank, whole nation. But somebody who is totally illiterate cannot even corrupt the whole the small community. Just one person, one neighbor, that's it. And may, at the most, they stealing something, that's it. Like 1,000, 10,000, one lakh, that's it. Otherwise, the, somebody very educated with a tremendous sophistication of the learning can be corrupted millions and billions of dollars. Okay. So he's always said that this is where we're going wrong. There's no room for um, heart development in modern education. Now, what we need is, at that, in those days, like 2003, 4, 5, his holiness was talking about the same concept today, what we have as universal ethics, same concept, his holiness would call as secular ethics in those days. And then because of you know, the sophistications coming here and there, and uh, the, the term, the label changed to universal ethics. Okay. And then the, okay, so with this what I'm saying is that the, say if you look at the, the world from different perspective, so this whole concept of the universal ethics, the need for universal ethics, which is one felt so strongly came into being because of the, this, the visible, the problems, the crisis the world faces. And the genesis of this conference was that I was in Israel. And then I got a mail from our secretary, Dinsi Shedunla, saying that Samia Leng Tibetan settlement, um, they, they want Tibet House to help them to, to convene. Uh, not really conference, um, the say, celebration of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, 6th July, 6th July last year. I said, what help? I asked and said that, oh, they are going to have uh, some kind of interfaith service and uh, they want to help to recruit the religious leaders from the different traditions. No, this is not what Samuel Ling does. I said, no, it may be some, uh, the injunction from the uh, central Tibetan administration. I said, no, this is from Samuel Ling. Then she sent me the forwarded the letter. Wow, that's something new. Amazing from, a great initiative from Samuel Ling uh, settlement. We must help. 
And then the I instructor gave her a very clear instruction that all the religious heads which we know, who we know well, and be directed towards the uh, Mr. Punzola. And then later on, the I received a mail saying that the head of the Samiling Tibetan settlement wanted to see me. And I said, yes, I was expecting somebody in gray hair, like 70 years old, a young gentleman showed up. Young gentleman showed up. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, this must be the reason why he wants to do something new in this settlement. And then we started to have some chat. And then he came up with the idea of the Universal Ethics Conference. I, said, I was so overjoyed to see that this place, the way Professor Kaviriji uh, explained that otherwise it's like a commercial hub, business transaction. And then the, 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 the transition place, like an airport, people come, go, come, go. This is a place where the education is hardly being discussed. And suddenly there's somebody, uh, Mr. De Pinzotopgela, the head of this the, the settlement. I was so, so overjoyed to see that there's somebody there with a brilliant vision to start this conference. Then we, I said that, let's go ahead with this. Let's go ahead. And then in, instantly I saw the help of Professor Kaviriji. While Tibet House, we have been organizing all these conferences for all these so many years. For example, in 2016, the way our secretary in her the introduction explained that His Holiness, we invited His Holiness to launch the Nalanda Master's Course 2016. Uh, so there, the, the, the theme on which His Holiness was to talk, or he talked on, was the universal ethics. So the, we have been used to convening those conferences, but I deliberately saw the help of Professor Kaviriji to make it more academic, from her very rich academic the lifestyle and uh, the exposure to Cambridge University, um, did a PhD there, then having taught there in Cambridge University and if now in Shivnadri University, inspiring many people in a very different <coughs> ways of the, <coughs> the in different ways to the to her students and. Um, then in this connection, uh, 2012, 2012, um, the, the then Dean of Planning of Delhi University, Professor Vivek Sunejaji, um, he had a, has a tremendous admiration, respect, admiration to his holiness the Dalai Lama's visions. And uh, when his holiness mentioned about the universal ethics or the secular ethics, then he just picked, it, picked up this idea and said that I'm going to implement this in Delhi University. So he started this from, so basically in India I would say that there was the first time which was the universal ethics implemented um, as a part of the education curriculum in 2012 in Delhi University in 17 colleges. And I'm not sure if uh, some of the college teachers or the professors were here are here uh, for this. So basically, the, and I was involved there for this program. It was a one-year pilot project. It was a great, great success. Um, every month, all these teachers, volunteer teachers, who volunteered to teach the universal ethics to their students, we come together. And there's no like um, they, there's somebody who's training, but we come together and the resource persons are all there and they, we started sharing our, say, the experiences, how, we, how um, you taught and what are the challenges. So this was how this was done and it was great success. Everybody speaking like th for three minutes, four minutes, and then everybody getting chance and then answers coming from the all others. So it was a great success to the point that what I'd like to share with you is that the outcome of this, what we expect is, for example, one of the, the points can be that one of the teachers said that I don't know to what extent this um, the universal ethics program is helping the students, but no doubt I am being benefited greatly from this. The way and the manner in which, the, as I teach, 
I start to think more and I start to become more tender, more soft, more calm, more compassionate. This is what the person said. This should be the basic idea of the universal ethics concept, number one. Number two, it should not be like, okay, now the, the bad side. Um, it should not be like what happened, um, the one incident I'd like to share with you. Okay, and the keeping everything else confidential, just a minute, the, the gist is coming out here. Somebody invited me for a conference. And guess what the, the theme of conference is? The theme of conference is conflict resolution. This is the theme of the conference. And I accepted simply as a support, to give more support to that person. I accepted despite me being very busy, traveling and so forth. Still, I tried to squeeze in at that program in my calendar. And then he was asking for the abstract. And I did not get time. I was traveling, traveling, traveling. I could, did not get time. And somehow the email got down, 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 down. And then, let's say, the uh, out of touch. And then suddenly our secretary got the email from him. The host of which conference? Conference on? Conflict resolution. What email came? Email said that your director, he accepted our invitation and he, we requested for the abstract, and the abstract never came. If he is not ready to send the abstract, tell him not to come. And the, not to come to what? Conflict resolution <laughs> conference. Who is that? The host of the conflict resolution, creating a conflict here. This should not happen. Same, universal ethics. We are talking about universal ethics, and then as a byproduct, not really by product, it's like, uh, the, it's like uh, it's a new development, development of more refined development of this, more like a branch of this universal ethics, is the sea learning. And there are many other programs happening nowadays, everywhere in the world. And in one university, again, uh, the, so for some Tata Institute of Social Sciences, the, the Professor Pashuramanji, the doctor, Professor, the Pashuramanji, who was the director, Again, I mentioned this concept to him, and he just said that we're going to start right now. And he picked up the idea, and he started this program in Tata Institute of Social Sciences. So likewise, many universities are picking up the ideas, and people have, have you know, make their own contribution. So what I'm saying is that these programs, how they finally, how it should be implemented, uh, should be in a nice way. That that people should be benefited, that the students should be benefited. This is so important, okay. And, um, and two things, one is to take this concept on a very sophisticated academic um, the journey, number one. Number two, boil down whatever academic sophistications that we develop, boil them down to the engaged universal ethics. That's very important. When that is missing, engage universal ethics. When that is missing, no point. Then it becomes too dry academic discussion. And then the, so therefore this conference, I would say that this is going to be so rich in terms of the, say, the experts speaking in a very sophisticated academic, and the, the presentations. Plus, we have the engaged universal ethics, uh, the members here, like Venerable Jamila here, and then we have the young girl here, Robin, and then we have Dr. Um, the Anita there, who is working so hard in her capacity to help many people, and for sure there are many others uh, who are actually into the engaged universal ethics programs. And this, but these presenters, they will make the presentations, and then the, the point is that to seek inspiration from them. So, the, okay, so one thing that I'd like to share with you is that the universal ethics, say the, what is going to be like the gist, so the, the details, the experts will they speak on this, the gist of this universal ethics. Oftentimes when I travel to the various uh, Tibetan schools, colleges and so forth, and even in the Indian schools, colleges, in the Western universities, where I travel, all, all these questions are coming up. What exactly is universal ethics? What are you doing now? 
But we already have. These are not universal ethics. Or um, what is universal ethics so different? In what way it's so special? This point. So for that, what we need to know is that the basic concept is that way Professor Kaviriji very clearly indicated that the these concepts are usually in the history of the humanity, we see that they are either tied up with the concept of the God, concept of God, which is, let's say, the, the theistic religion, concept of God, God-fearing, then automatically ethics come into being, this one thing. And then the other one is with the non-theistic, is with the karma, concept of karma, and they say the, what we have, God-fearing, karma-fearing. So this concept, again, uh, say the, makes us flow in a more ethical form. Then the next, what about those people who don't believe in God? What about those people who don't believe in karma? So this is issue. So there, then the historian says that whether you believe in religion or not, it doesn't matter. So the ethics finally should rule the world. And the world may not necessarily be consistent only of the, th only of the theistic people or those who believe in the karma. So it must reach out, it must be something acceptable to all people across the, the globe. So that is that everyone should, you speak about ethics, any concept, that everybody should be able to say that yes, this is relevant to me. Okay, so that his students calls as universal ethics. And so now say that the, um, the what was the, what's the problem? Why do we need, why there's the need to emphasize on this part, universal ethics was the problem? So for this, we need to know, know a little bit of the psychology. Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory. So where, he said that the, Basically, the organisms are ruled, are governed by this self-centered thinking. Without this self-centered thinking, survival of the fittest. You should be so fit to survive. So for that, who will take care of you? You will take care of yourself. And this mindset, self-centered thinking, this is, they say, evolved along the, the human, human evolution since like the 0.3 million years ago. So from there it evolved. And this is a gift of the evolution. What's wrong with that self-centered attitude? Anger, attachment, craving, fear, these emotions, what's wrong with them? These are the gifts. Without these, you cannot survive. Say so for example, how do you survive? You should survive with the best of the facilities and to stay away from the unconditional environment. And what makes you stay away from the unconditional environment? The fear. Anger. Anger is, I don't like this, stay away. This is anger. So anger helps you to push aside what is unconducive. And the attachment, craving, they, helps you to, they help you to get what you want, what is conducive. So this is how you survive. This is Charles Darwin's, Charles Darwin's evolutionary theory. So, and underlying, underscoring these emotions, like what pushes things away, unconscious factors away, and what attracts what you want. Underlying that is the selfish genes. Selfish genes. And this is what underlines all these things. So, if this is a basic trend, this is a belief that we are the selfish genes. If this is an attitude, the world will never be a happy world. The world will never be a happy world. This is reality. Now the question is, how can we have an alternative way by which, by which to accept the facts plus the world does not go into crisis. The world finds a better place. More the greater harmony, prosperity, joy, peace, and conflict resolutions all happening. How? So for that, it's very important that the, to know the psychology of the, the, the human beings. How our mind works. And so this crisis is not just global warming. It's not just the, the world economy turned down, the running, the uh, turned down, turning down of the world economy. Then the, on the last scale, corruption. Oh, it has nothing to do with me, nothing to do with me. No. Domestic violence, for example. Domestic violence is increasing. There is no feeling of say, the feeling of closeness, a 
affection towards each other. Look at how we treat our mothers. We shout at mothers. This is what is happening. So if that is what is happening, how can you expect? And then the parents, nowadays, the parents are so busy with the gadgets, Facebook, PUBG and these things. And the children, they are neglected. And the children, as they grow older, they, they grow more strong, self-sufficient. Parents grow older and then they're more dependent. The parents lack the care from the children because the children are busy with the gadgets. So this is what the world is today. And the domestic violence. This is so common. In fact, in my office, I said, I meet with many people. Most of the, the problems people come up with is domestic violence. Domestic violence for numerous reasons. So these things, we see that this is all because of the, the need for the universal ethics. So where somebody doesn't believe in God, somebody doesn't believe in karma, still how can I really uh, say, uh, the, be a decent person? So these are the, the questions. On that basis, the point is that if we learn, each one of us, in particular, we are so happy that here in Samyeling Tibetan settlement, and there are so many youngsters. Youngsters, this is a, the, this, this sign of the progress and hope that His Holiness's vision can really boil down, can really come to be materialized through you as the angels of this great vision. So what is really happening is that we need to gain conviction. Be good, be good. Anybody can say this. But how on this question? This is a problem. How? Oh no, we have to convene more conferences and then we have to tell people, create awareness. Create awareness what? That the world needs more prosperity, the, more, the world needs peace, harmony, the, the, the conflicts in the name of religion, in the, the, the name of caste, all this things should be resolved. Yes, people know that. But how to leave an impact in the mind for that the people should gain conviction? Conviction. Conviction, speeches are given, but the conviction is not coming in the minds of the youngsters. How to instill this conviction? That is important. For that matter, we need to know the psychology, how the mind works. For example, let's say that, okay, this morning, this morning, okay, I already signed up for this conference, Universal Ethics. Okay, the, uh, today I got a message from my friend, and he, he said something very nasty towards me. I'm, my, my day is just the put off. Okay, and now there's no point, I'll not go to the conference. And then, on the other hand, you might have just, um, okay, in case if I want to, I will go. Then you just sign up. In case, not that you want to go. And then the morning, morning, somebody, somebody give you said that, you are such a wonderful person, it's amazing. You are somebody who really helps so many people. Wow, are you sure? Yes. Amazing, right? You open the whole day is uplifted with joy. And then today, what did I do? what did I sign up? I signed up for the universal ethics. Wow, this is amazing. This is what I you know the person is talking. Okay, I'll, I'll go. Look, so what is happening is that they say the what makes you drunk to go? What inhibits you to go? That is determined by the feelings inside. The feelings. Pleasant feeling with the prospect of going. If the pleasant feeling arises in you, it will make you move. Where the unpleasant feeling arises in you, somebody says something nasty towards you, okay, now you made me, you put me off, okay, I'll not go now. So, when the unpleasant feeling arises, you just stop. So this movement, working for the community, okay, staying away from corruption, staying away from domestic violence, opting for dialogue, opting to dialogue. All these things are determined by the feelings inside. And what determines the feelings? That feeling is decided by your cognitive thought process. Cognitive thought process. Let's say, for example, let's say somebody shouts at you. Somebody shouts at you. Hey, Mr. A! Miss A! Shouts at you in the public. Are you going to be offended or not offended? Anyone? Offended or not offended? It's not sure. It depends on you. 
right? Say, if the pleasant feeling comes, somebody shouts at you, then you don't feel offended, you feel it's an honor. When the unpleasant feeling comes, then you feel offended. So what decides this pleasant and unpleasant feeling? Your thought, cognitive thought process. Wow, in this 1,000 people, now all these people, they come to know my name, right? My friend shouted at me, so now everybody knows my name. Yes, I'm here, right? So there's, you take it very positively, that thought process, that now everybody knows my name. I'm so happy, I don't have to advertise myself. Well, he did it, she did it for me. Very pleasant feeling comes to you, whereas how uncultured this person is. He even does not know how to talk, right? Embarrassing me in public. If this is your attitude, very unpleasant feeling comes to you. This feeling will make you very unhappy and then will do something negative. So the point is to make it a gist, is that it's all about the psychology. Unless until you are able to convince somebody through how your mind works, let the person experiment it. Till that point, no matter how much conferences, how much lectures uh, that you give, there's no point. So therefore, these lectures, these conferences are meant to give conviction in the youngsters, and these youngsters will carry this message of the universal ethics to the world. So I'm so happy that we have so many youngsters here, and then particularly the experts, plus the engaged universal ethics, the implementers here. So this is a great joy for me. And, um, and let me conclude with the um, Albert Einstein's quote. Albert Einstein. What he said is that why the world suffers is because of our, the narrowness of the scope of our compassion. Where we simply love our near and dear ones, and we con cannot spread this love and affection towards the broader circle. That is the cause. That is the optical illusion. Illusion of me, my, you, and they. This is optical illusion. That binds us from not being able to, from expanding your circle of love and affection. So for that matter, he emphasized that this optical illusion must be removed. That this barrier created by the optical illusion, I and you, must be removed. For example, let's say, where in the world, all these problems are coming, because of the creation of the sense of I and you, we and they, on the basis of religion, on the basis of caste, on the basis of the borders and geographical borders, on the basis of gender, all these things happen because of this creation of the I and you. This cognitive thought process is poison. As long as this cognitive thought process is there, as the priority, as long as this is there, universal ethics will not happen. Without which, the world will never come to uh, find itself in peace. So therefore, I really congratulate uh, the uh, Mr. The Tsongla, Pinzola, Mr. Pinzola, and so for this conference, what I would say is that in these Tibetan, the, the, the Tibet house, uh, the staff, the younger ones, they really worked so hard for all these, you know, the, almost like one year, they worked so hard, and this amazingly, for the first time, maybe like an academic conference happening in Samyeling Tibetan settlement, this is made possible because of from the Mr. Pinzola and the Tibetan, the Tibet House young staff like Tinsi Shudunla and the Tinsi Dumala and all the staff here. And then our uh, Professor Kaviriji, um, she is incredible asset for Tibet House and uh, for the world, I would say. Okay, so thank you so much. And the, the participants, all the presenters, the experts, and, the, and those who implement this universal ethics in your life for the, the larger community and all the participants, the youngsters, they're all young boys and girls. I'm so, so happy. Why not we carry this message of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the Universal Ethics, and start it. Charity begins at? Charity begins at home. At home, stop shouting at your mother. <laughs> at home, stop, stop shouting at your mother. If the mother says, Okay, my daughter, you like a cup of tea? What cup of tea? 
Instead of that, say, Mom, stay, sit, sit, sit. I'll serve you tea. What do you like to have? Tea, coffee, juice, water. If this happens, this is the universal ethics. So this attitude you're going to spread to your friends. Your friends will see you. This is how we spread the ripples of universal ethics, the vision, incredibly great vision of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So therefore, and you may think that, you may think that, okay, this is just, you know, we are just, the, the bad things that happen on large scale, millions of people, good things happening just in some healing, the word settlement, very small scale, never give up, evils will win, evil, evils will win when the angels retreat. We are all the angels, angels of good things. Evil will invariably win when the angels retreat. So therefore, no matter how much small the size, we all are not to give up. Just start, keep in mind the charity begins at home. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gishla. Uh, may I now request uh, Professor Siddiq Wahid, scholar in residence Shif Nadar University, our guest of honor for the event. Uh, Professor Siddiq Wahid is a historian of Central Eurasian and Tibetan history and an adjunct fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies. At present, he is a resident scholar at Shiv Nadar University. Prior to this, uh, Professor Wahid was the founding vice chancellor of Islamic University of Science and Technology, a senior visiting uh, fellow at the Center for Policy Research, the first Gulab Singh chair professor in modern history at the University of Jammu, and director of Institute of Kashmir Studies at the University of Kashmir. He has also been a member of several national and state academic bodies. He has several academic public publications in Indian and foreign publications. Professor Wahid received his PhD and master's from Harvard University. Uh, he is also on the editorial board of the Jindal Journal of Public Policy. Professor Siddiq Wahid. Thank you for that very long introduction. Kongo um, Mudubla and uh, Venerable Geshe Dambula, um, Professor Gill, and Mr. Tobgila. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm embarrassed because uh, for two reasons. One, it's an honor to be a guest of honor <laughs> um, uh, because one knows that uh, there are sort of many others in the audience sitting who deserve uh, that position much more than I do. I'm certain of that looking at some of us here. And secondly, <clears throat> to be a guest of honor is a roundabout way of telling you you're getting old. You know, uh, so I don't know which of these it is, it's probably both, but uh, whatever, you know. Um, <clears throat> we are here for two days to discuss universal ethics. Um, and um, when Professor Gill asked me, uh, she first asked me, you know, will you speak at it? And I must admit to being a little bit nervous because I'm an historian, and at that, a political historian, you know, and we uh, sort of experts like to only speak in the context of us as tyrann tyrannical specialists, you know, because then you speak in a language that nobody else understands, uh, and it doesn't matter because you can recede it, oh, I'm a specialist, you know, in this area, and so forth. And uh, but it was obviously a topic that uh, was, is very high on the mind of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And so I conceded. And then to my relief, he said, she said, you won't have to speak um, b for a long time, but uh, you, know, you uh, sort of will be the guest of honor. So it was like I was very relieved and then I was very embarrassed. Uh, you know, what do you do? Um, in anyways, I'm happy to be here, and I've thought long and hard 
about why we are doing this. I mean, two days of talking about universal ethics, because uh, we're used to, I mean, what does it mean? As Geshe-la concluded, you know, at the end of the day, it means good manners. You know, why don't we have good manners anymore? You know, and uh, in a way, it's very sad, you know, because all religions teach us. They teach us how to have an attitude towards the world and towards our fellow human beings. I mean, this is very simple. You know, we are taught that from childhood. All religion, religions um, tell us how to form your intent when you do something. All religions tell us how to focus. All religions tell us how to behave, how to speak, and how to contemplate. All the religions do, and most explicitly, Buddhism does. What I cited just now was the Eightfold Path, basically. You know, and, and I don't think we can find a religion that unfolds an Eightfold Path. Not you know, explic as explicitly as Buddhism does, but implicitly it's all there. Um, so why are these values at such a low um, in, in our world today? I think <coughs> it has to do with a huge deterioration in our language. I, I mean, I watch television uh, and watch the news and I'm appalled by how our so-called leaders speak to each other you know, and about each other. Um, there is also an attitude of my country first, my state first. But, I mean, in some ways it's natural, right? But in other ways, it is also, you know, sort of locking up, at that assertion with which it is being spelt out seems to knock out the idea of sharing anymore. No more, you know. Um, most especially, it seems to lay claim on identity. You know, your identity is this. Now, we all have identities, you know, and, and I wouldn't give up mine um, as a Ladakhi, as a Tibetan-speaking world person in the Tibetan-speaking complex, um, as, as a, you know, a sort of a resident of the Himalaya, as a citizen of, a, of India, um, as a citizen of South Asia, I mean, why would I give up any of these identities? But when we start to choose and stress only one or the other, it creates problems. And I think we're faced with that. And the other is the simple thing about greed, you know, um, and the need to grab in this sort of age of rapidly shrinking resources, whether it be the air we breathe or the water we drink, um, and so forth. So I think that this is um, what it is. And um, so we have to go back to good manners. I mean, it's primary school time, right? I mean, I think. And it is only His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, that can put that before us by saying, you're all badly behaving children. That's what he's doing, you know. And it's only His Holiness the Dalai Lama which can write a book saying, who can write a book, sorry, saying, let's go beyond religion. A book that I just received, you know, and you open the book and he says, I am a man of religion. But religion alone cannot solve all our problems. You know, it's an, it's an interesting thing that can be only done by this person. Which is why I think I, my family, my father, 
who used to say to me very regularly, observe the behavior of the Tibetans and of His Holiness. It's very brave. You have to be brave in the world today to say, go beyond religion, you know. Because I know for a fact, I'm a Muslim and a practicing Muslim, and I know for a fact that the first ones to jump on the bandwagon will be the mullahs, you know, saying, how dare you say such a thing? You know, and I don't think the Hindu priest would be any different. I don't think that um, Christian priests and pastors would be any different. I think, so, you know, we're Jewish, another, you know, would be, and I dare say Buddhists also in many parts of the world. And all religions, sort of the formality of the religions would rebel against something like this. And I think that this is something to bear in mind because then how do we resolve it? Because we cannot say that nobody, uh, there is anybody really, or, or there's a large section who don't profess to belong to a religion. In fact, I dare say most of the world would say, I belong to a certain religion. And so this is, uh, this is a question that I've been struggling with uh, for a long time, even as an undergraduate uh, young man, 21, 22. And I remember asking um, one of my uh, teachers, uh, not professors in college, but a teacher whom I had gotten to know and who was a philosopher and, and a very well uh, sort of, you know, I mean, he was accomplished, uh, let's put it that way. Um, and I said, you know, how do I resolve this? And I was 22 or 23, you know, and he said, okay, and he drew a circle. Um, it was not with a compass, but one got the idea, you know. And he then looked at it and he said, look, it has a center and it has a circumference and it has radii that are coming from the circumference to the center. He said the radii are the religions of the world and they are numerous, you know. The center is where we all strive. And if you notice, if you go from the circumference towards the center, each of the radii come closer and closer and closer to each other until it dissolves in the center. You know, so I think that, um, and he said to me also after that, he said, that is how you should practice your religion. You know, as if you are moving towards the center because that's the idea. And if you do that, he said, um, you are practicing one religion explicitly, but implicitly you're practicing them all. You know, so it's a, it's an interest. It was an interesting sort of image and a metaphor to have uh, received at a fairly young age. I don't want to say at a very young age because I know some very young people I hear um, and would not like to be identified as just being, you know, that um, sort of ignorant about these things. But um, so that is, I think, how we need to look at our religions. There's still the dichotomy. What do we do about the religion? You know, because it interferes. Let's face it, it interferes. My suggestion on that would be that, and I'm sort of stepping uh, out of an arena, but my suggestion would that be to, for that would be to listen uh, to a uh, sort of uh, 16th century Sufi saint. Sufi, as you know, is the mystical dimension within Islam, um, who said that yes, I mean, many Sufis would not pray necessarily in the way that, you know, sort of everybody prays in, in Islam, in, in the Muslim. And he said, yes, it's like throwing away the prayer mat, you know, because you pray on a prayer mat, right? It's a, he said, it's like throwing away the prayer mat, 
but with the difference that in order to throw away a pear mat, you have to have it in the first place. Otherwise, you can't throw it away. You know? So I think that we need to understand tradition. We need to understand what it is that are really in, a, in a way that is perhaps beyond religion, as in the institution, and more beyond what is the spirit of the religion. And as Keshila um, was speaking, it was very clear that he was speaking about our inner person. Do we go from the inside out, or do we come from the outside in? Am I enamored of being called a professor, or of, you know, uh, sort of the various things that I did which are external to me? You know, or is it that there is something within me that gives me some sort of confidence and some sort of calm? You know, and I think that that is what um, the teachings of uh, all the religions in many ways spell. But I think that it's something that is lost to us. We live, ladies and gentlemen, in an age that needs courage. You know, in many aspects of our lives, economic, political, economic, because we have to think about sharing and going against the idea of grab everything you can because it may not exist tomorrow. You know, we need to go against the grain of, you know, accumulating bookish knowledge and say, what's simple? I mean, what, what is good manners? I mean, let's start doing it. You know, the other day I was horrified to see a young girl, I mean, young, I mean, I'm saying something like six or seven years old, and uh, this was one of those YouTube things, uh, reciting a poem which denigrated her fellow citizens, you know, uh, to such a degree in such a way as to say, well, you know, kill them, shoot them. I mean, this was a poem in Hindi that was being recited, and I was just horrified. It's just same <laughs> bad manners, you know, to talk about that for a neighbor, about a neighbor, or something like that. So, let me close with a thought, and that is that in order to have courage, you know, or in order to sort of you know, uh, correct the wrongs that we have sort of seemed to have seeped ourselves into, whether it's climate, whether it's political, uh, whether it's social, whether it's economic. Um, as I said, we need courage. And can we understand that courage doesn't have to do with the degree you have, it doesn't have to do with the intelligence you have, it has to do with clarity of thought, period. If you're clear in your thinking, you can speak clearly. If you speak clearly, you'll be heard clearly. And I think that that's the challenge that uh, springs before us. And um, I'll conclude by saying I look forward to the next two days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wahid. Uh, may I now request uh, our chief guest, Kasur Modub Dongchungla, representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, New Delhi, to address the gathering. Kasur Modub Dongchungla joined the Central Tibetan Administration in 1977. He has served the Central Tibetan Administration in various administrative positions. In 2007, Mr. Modub Dongchungla was nominated and duly approved by the 14th Tibetan Parliament in exile as a Kalu. Uh, cabinet Minister. Again in 2011, under the political uh, leadership of Dr. Lobsang Singhi, he was nominated and approved as the Kalim for Department of Security, uh, Central Tibetan Administration. However, he retired as the Kalim of Department of Security in 2016. Um, and in the same year, he was appointed as the representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in Delhi, succeeding Kasur Temba Sringla and continues to serve till date. Uh, Kasur Ngodub Dongchula.
Rechtele. <coughs> I must thank the former speakers, the wonderful speeches, the touching and uh, thought-provoking speeches they gave. Basically, I took the courage to accept to be the chief guest here because of just two reasons. One, I being the representative of CTA at the same time, and this young German settlement officer has taken the initiative and to encourage that, and I see lots of young people also. And second, the topic itself. Of course, I'm not a serious Buddhist student and a practitioner, but I always try to respect the values as uh, say the manners which the Tibetans have inherited in them. So I for the going I'll read out my formal <laughs> uh, thing written for this occasion. First of all, I would like to begin by expressing my deep appreciation and commendation to the Tibet House. I know Dr. Damdala has been doing a wonderful job on this subject, and the Tibetan Settlement Officer jointly organizing this two-day conference on universal ethics. I also convey my hearty greetings to the distinguished intellectuals, those who spoke here and the other panelists who are going to speak afterwards. So I must congratulate the young, energetic Tibetan settlement of Mr. Pinzo. His Holiness the Dalai Lama always says that unlike the 20th century, which was a century of war and bloodshed, the 21st century should be a century of peace and dialogue. In order to achieve this, I, we must fundamentally change the people's way of thinking through education. However, His Holiness has pointed out time and again that the modern education is highly oriented towards material goals and the achievements of the physical comfort only. It does not pay enough attention to our mental consciousness. Entire generation have been brought up with a materialistic outlook in a materialistic culture and way of life. Although we want to live in peace, we don't know how to tackle the biggest obstacle, uh, just destructive emotions. We therefore need to improve the current education system by introducing instructions on the way to cultivate positive emotions like warm-heartedness. However, relying on religious traditions won't appeal to everyone. We need a more universal approach based on common experience common sense and uh, scientific findings. Thus, the concept of universal ethics to put forward, as put forward by His Holiness, is quite revolutionary and draws heavily from the ancient Indian knowledge about the workings of the mind. The ancient Indian knowledge is still very much relevant in today's world. It can equip us to deal with our destructive emotions and bring about a transformation of the mind, whether we have any religious belief or not. What I have said here today is just a layman's perspective on universal ethics. During this two-day conference, you will hear scholarly talks and presentations on universal ethics from a wide area of outstanding intellectuals from various perspectives. And the topic is uh, 
white one. No? Just as a journey of million miles starts with a single step to bring about change in the whole society, we must first start with individuals, especially the youths. It is therefore my earnest hope and belief that this conference will further deepen your knowledge and conviction in the idea of universal ethics. With these words, I would like to conclude by thanking both the organizers and the governors and the scholars and the intellectuals, professors who gave wonderful speeches and also who are giving uh, in the next sessions. Before ending, I think a large number of Tibetan students have also come and I would like to speak briefly in Tibetan also. Naramzo Tanda Sangjo La Matembe Karsora Chyo La Matembe Sangjo Siegi Tataregi Chyoshiti Naramzo Pyoba Yemba Yena Inji Menji Ki Chyolo La Matembe Chyko Hem Mewe Soro Chyi Ta Naram Sama Yongra Ki Kelin Chyko Yoroba Naramzo Nangjo La Lomye Chyje Tunye Chyje Mune Di Yine Mene Ranzo che è un numero di 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 ranzo che c'è un altro mango che si può fare, c'è un altro 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 che si può non so se io devo dire che se non la yobe, 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 mi sono detto che non c'è nessuno che si è 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 detto che non se la pendo che ma dove ne ne ma che che sono di gran sangue se non lo io vedi tu ti pe che c'è morire se non tu ci tu non hai mai detto che 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 non hai mai detto Kala Kanzam Gita go Deva Chaja Turabi Nala Dina Le Salon Chen Yombe Tuva Chire Judizama Dina Lola G. Dili Torim Lapta Tsuvegi Mango Shivuji Tsu Yonye Yore Tenga Dunju Tundan La Yonye Nda Tande Yonye Nki Kuryo De Kyun Tuk Mindu Sangudu Tenji De Kishala Kanansu Tenga Inanga Zutwa Changdung Gya Gayung Gore Tuba Momo Sa Gayung Gore Tande tu va a dire che le cose che si sono fatte, 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 Tende imbe c'è una cosa che va a fare. Sosso rani, sova caritengi, non è mene. 
我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内我们的城内
guide us, lead us, motivate us. We, fa we feel proud and thankful for making us feel confident with your guidance to of this conference become reality. I also would like to thank all the speakers of inaugural sessions of this conference for not only capturing the theme of this conference, but also clearly articulate the significance. I also would like to thank all the various scholars who are going to speak on the various aspects related to this important topic during the course of this conference. An event of this dimension cannot happen without uh, happen or night. The wheel start rolling months in advance. We have been formulated enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated committees and volunteers. I cannot thank everyone enough for the involvement they have shown and the willingness they have expressed to take on the completion of tasks beyond their comfort zone. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the participants who have registered to attend this conference so enthusiastically. Thank you all and thank you very much. Thank you, Kongo Pinsula. Uh, we have come to the conclusion of the inaugural session. We will now break for tea. Uh, before we break for tea, I would like to thank our chief guests and guests of honor and uh, Geshila and Kongo Pinsula and Dr. Kaveri Gil. Uh, uh, so we'll break for tea and we have 20 minutes for tea and refreshment. We'll come back at 11.55 and we'll start with We'll start with the first session, which is universal ethics is a shared value set possible. Thank you. Tea will be served out, uh, outside the hall and at the rooftop. Thank you. And a quick announcement, I request all the speakers uh, to come on the stage, we will take a group picture. Thank you. <laughs> 